Hi everyone, I am Ruchi Kulkarni. Today let's do the chapter packing from class 9 Beehive book and this chapter is written by Jerome K. Jerome. We all like going on trips but have you ever wondered what it feels like when it comes to packing? It might create a lot of frustration in all of us because it is time taking but actually packing is a very creative and innovative process. If it is done properly, you are happy. Today's story, Packing, is about three friends who are getting ready to go for a journey. So obviously it begins with them starting the most important thing of a journey, that is packing. This story is an extract taken from Three Men in a Boat, written by Jerome K. Jerome. It forms one of the chapters of that novel. Now in here, Jerome is the narrator himself and writes about the experience that he has while his friends decide to start packing. It's a hilarious story about these three adults struggling to do that basic thing as packing and also trying to adjust with the menacing of their pet dog Montmorency. Let's read and understand this interesting story after which I will give you the significance of the title followed by the moral of the story and then the summary in the written form and the question answers related to this chapter which includes both thinking about text and thinking about the language. And before we begin with the session, let's know something about the author Jerome K. Jerome. Jerome K. Jerome was born on 2nd May 1859 in Staffordshire, England. He was an English writer and humorist best known for his comic travelogue Three Men in a Boat which he wrote in 1889. His other famous essay collections are Idle Thoughts of an Idle Fellow, Second Thoughts of an Idle Fellow, Three Men on the Bummel which is a sequel to Three Men in a Boat and many more. He died on 14th June 1927 in Northampton at the age of 68. I said I'd pack. This line means the writer Jerome liked to pack luggage for trips and announced that he would do the packing. I rather pride myself on my packing. Pride myself means I'm proud of. Packing is one of those many things that I feel I know more about than any other person living. It surprises me myself. Sometimes, how many such things there are? I impressed the fact upon George and Harris and told them that they had better leave the whole matter entirely to me. They fell into the suggestion with a readiness that had something uncanny about it. Fell into means accepted and uncanny means strange. George spread himself over the easy chair and Harris cocked his legs on the table. Cocked means bent. This was hardly what I intended. Intended means planned or meant. What I had meant, of course, was that I should boss the job and that Harris and George should potter about under my directions. Potter about means do some unimportant things. I pushing them aside every now and then with, Oh you, here, let me do it. There you are, simple enough. Really teaching them, as you might say. They taking it in the way they did irritated me. There is nothing does irritate me more than seeing other people sitting about doing nothing when I am working. This chapter starts with the line where the writer tells his friends that he would do the packing. That was because the writer was proud of himself when it came to packing. He felt that he was the most perfect person who could pack things so nicely than any other person in this world. And he wanted to tell this to George and Harris. When he did that, the situation was entirely different. They both of them left what they were doing and they just relaxed. George spread on the easy chair and Harris bent his leg on the table and he sat in a very relaxed manner. So everything fell 
on the writer's shoulders. But this was not the writer wanted to tell them. What he meant was that he should boss the job that Harris and George should pack under his directions. And this that the other people just laced around and the narrator was doing all the job really irritated the narrator. I lived with a man once who used to make me mad that way. He would loll on the sofa, loll means lie or rest, and watch me doing things by the hour together. He said it did him real good to look on at me messing about. Now, I am not like that. I can't sit still and see another man slaving and working. I want to get up and superintend. Superintend means supervise and walk around with my hands in my pockets and tell him what to do. It is my energetic nature. I can't help it. However, I did not say anything, but started the packing. It seemed a longer job than I had thought it was going to be, but I got the bag finished at last and I sat on it and strapped it. Strapped means fixed or closed. Ain't you going to put the boots in? said Harris. And I looked around and found I had forgotten them. That's just like Harris. He couldn't have said a word until I had got the bag shut and strapped, of course. And George laughed. One of those irritating senseless laughs of his. They do make me so wild. Wild means angry. The narrator then shares that he once lived with a man who used to do just like George and Harris. He always laced around on the sofa and watched everything done by the narrator. But the narrator was not like that. Of course he would not sit still. But of course he would not sit still and let somebody else do all the work. He would like to get up. He would like to supervise, walk around with his hands in his pocket and tell others what to do. That was his nature. Now, when George and Harris had just given up, it was his responsibility to pack the bag. And it seemed to be longer, but ultimately he did it. He finished and he fixed or closed the bag. And just when he did that, Harris reminded him about the boots. Of course, the narrator had forgotten about it. And he thought that why didn't Harris tell him earlier before packing the entire bag? And George, on the other hand, was laughing. And his laugh was irritating the narrator. It was making him very angry. I opened the bag and packed the boots in. And then, just as I was going to close it, a horrible idea occurred to me. Had I packed my toothbrush? I don't know how it is, but I never do know whether I have packed my toothbrush. My toothbrush is a thing that haunts me when I'm traveling and makes my life a misery. Haunts here means to repeatedly give trouble. I dream that I haven't packed it and wake up in a cold perspiration. Perspiration means sweat and get out of bed and hunt for it. And in the morning, I pack it before I have used it and have to unpack again to get it. And it is always the last thing I turn out of the bag. And then I repack and forget it and have to rush upstairs for it at the last moment and carry it to the railway station wrapped up in my pocket handkerchief. After the boots, the next thing that struck the narrator's mind was his toothbrush. He was very fussy about his toothbrush. He could never leave it because leaving his toothbrush behind was like a nightmare for him. It haunted him all the time he would travel. He always dreams that he hasn't packed his toothbrush and the moment he wakes up, he packs it. And then he again unpacks the toothbrush. He takes it out to brush his teeth. The next time when he forgets to pack the toothbrush or he doesn't remember whether he has packed it or not, there have been times when he had to rush upstairs to his bedroom the last moment and carry that toothbrush which he had forgotten to pack wrapped in a pocket handkerchief and take it to the railway station.
So this series of events tell us that narrator could also have been forgetful. Of course, I had to turn every mortal thing out now. And of course, I could not find it. Every mortal thing here means every ordinary thing which was packed in the bag. I rummaged the things up into much the same state that they must have been before the world was created. Rummaged means searched in a hurry or careless way. And when chaos reigned, chaos reigned means all the troubles had ruled. Of course, I found George and Harris 18 times over, but I couldn't find my own. I put the things back one by one and held everything up and shook it. Then I found it inside a boot. I repacked once more. When I had finished, George asked if the soap was in. I said I didn't care a hang whether the soap was in or whether it wasn't. And I slammed the bag shut and strapped it and found that I had packed my spectacles in it. Spectacles are eyeglasses and had to reopen it. It got shut up finally at 10 5 p.m. And then there remained the hampers to do. Hampers are large baskets for carrying food. Harris said that we should be wanting to start in less than 12 hours time and thought that he and George had better do the rest. And I agreed and sat down and they had a go. So the narrator now was very anxious about whether he had packed his toothbrush or not. He opened the bag and he picked out all the things that he had packed. It was really chaotic. He saw George and Harris toothbrush 18 times, but he didn't see his own even once. And then at last he found it in one of the boots. So again, he had to repack his bag, put all the stuff inside properly and do the whole job again. When he had finished, George asked him whether he had taken the soap or not. But by then the narrator was so irritated that he did not actually care about the soap. He slammed the bag and he closed it. And after he closed it, he again realized that he had left his eyeglasses or spectacles inside the bag. So he had to reopen it. Finally, the bag was shut by 10 5. And then after that, there remained baskets of food. And so Harris and George suggested the narrator to take some rest and they'll do the rest of the packing of food. They began in a light-hearted spirit, evidently intending to show me how to do it. I made no comment. I only waited. With the exception of George, Harris is the worst packer in this world. And I looked at the piles of plates and cups and kettles and bottles and jars and pies and stoves and cakes and tomatoes, etc. and felt that the thing would soon become exciting. It did. They started with breaking a cup. That was the first thing they did. They did that just to show you what they could do and to get you interested. Then Harris packed the strawberry jam on top of a tomato and squashed it. Squashed means crushed it. And they had to pick out the tomato with a teaspoon. Now George and Harris had begun to pack the food items, that is the hamper. And they started with a very light-hearted spirit, that is very happily. They Maybe they tried to show the narrator how to do it happily. But the narrator knew that something would go wrong. They were a pile of plates, cups, kettles, bottles, jars, pies, stoves, cakes, tomatoes, etc. to be packed. And then it all began with breaking off a cup. That was the first thing they did. They broke a cup. And then after that, the thing started to become interesting. Then Harris packed the strawberry jam on top of a tomato. And of course, the tomato then got crushed. So they had to remove the crushed tomato from the basket with the help of a spoon. Now let's see what happens next. And then it was George's turn and he trod on the butter. Trod on means stepped on. I didn't say anything, but I came over and sat on the edge of the table and watched them. It irritated them more than anything I could have said. I felt that. It made them nervous and excited and they stepped on things and put things behind them 
and then couldn't find them when they wanted them and they packed the pies at the bottom and put heavy things on top and smashed the pies in they upset salt over everything and as for the butter i never saw two men do more with one and two pence worth of butter in my whole life than they did after george had got it off his slipper they tried to put it in the kettle it wouldn't go in and what was in wouldn't come out they did scrape it out at last scrape means dragged or pulled and put it down on a chair and harris sat on it and it stuck to him and they went looking for it all over the room next george stepped on the butter the narrator remained silent but sat on the edge of the table to watch the action his silence irritated his friends they became nervous and stepped on the things they kept the things behind them and later when they wanted them they could not find them they placed the pies on the bottom and kept heavier things on them which smashed the pies the boys also overturned the can of salt on everything the narrator said that they created a lot of confusion with a small piece of butter that was just worth 1 and 2 pence which means that it was a small piece of butter and for that small piece of butter they created a lot of ruckus they fought over it george removed it from the slipper and he tried to put that butter into the kettle but he was unable to do that he placed it on a chair and harris sat on the chair so the butter stuck to him he stood up and both the boys went around the room looking for that piece of butter i will take my oath i put it down on the chair oath means swear said george staring at the empty seat i saw you do it myself not a minute ago said harris then they started round the room again looking for it here it means the butter and then they met again in the center and stared at one another most extraordinary thing i ever heard of said george so mysterious said harris then george got round at the back of harris and saw it why here it is all the time he explained indignantly indignantly means angrily where cried harris spinning around stand still can't you roared george flying after him and they got it off and packed it in the teapot now george and harris started to look for that missing piece of butter that piece of butter was actually stuck on the back of harris but they both did not know they searched the whole room they still did not find and they thought that it was something very extraordinary or mysterious and just then george looked at the back of harris and they found that butter and finally they took that butter and packed it in the teapot montmorency was in it all of course montmorency was their pet dog that was his name Montmorency's ambition in life is to get in the way and be sworn at. Be sworn at here means get scolded. If he can squirm in anywhere where he particularly is not wanted, squirm means slide and be a perfect nuisance. Nuisance means inconvenience and make people mad and have things thrown at his head, then he feels his day has not been wasted. to get somebody to stumble over him to stumble over means to almost fall and curse him steadily for an hour is his highest aim and object and when he has succeeded in accomplishing this his conceit becomes quite unbearable conceit here means his pride in himself he came and sat down on things just when they were wanted to be packed and he labored under the fixed belief that whenever harris and george reached out their hand for anything it was his cold damp nose that they wanted he put his leg into the jam and he worried worried means disturbed the teaspoons and he pretended means making as if that the lemons were rats and got into the hamper 
and killed three of them before Harris could land him with the frying pan. To land someone or land him here is an idiom which means to hit someone very hard. The narrator here feels that as if all this was not enough and there comes their pet dog. The name of the dog was Montmorency. Montmorency's ambition in life was only to disturb others and get scolded. He was a perfect nuisance, means he created a lot of inconvenience to other people so that the people will get mad, they will throw things on his head and after that the dog will feel very nice. He would feel that his day hasn't been wasted. So that was the kind of dog he was, very naughty and creating troubles for everyone. So he sat on those things which were to be packed and he tried to make this happen that whenever George or Harris tried to pick up something for packing, they would only catch hold of his damp nose. And later on, Montmorency put his leg into the jam and he also disturbed the teaspoons. He thought that those lemons which were being packed were like rats and he got after them. He got into the basket, he picked up the lemons and he crushed at least three of them. On seeing Montmorency's naughtiness or his troubles, Harris could not control himself. He picked up the frying pan and hit hard at the dog. Harris said, I encouraged him. I didn't encourage him. A dog like that doesn't want any encouragement. It's the natural origin sin that is born in him that makes him do things like that. The packing was done at 12.50 and Harris sat on the big hamper and said he hoped nothing would be found broken. George said that if anything was broken, it was broken, which reflection seemed to comfort him. Reflection here means thought. He also said he was ready for bed. We were all ready for bed. Harris was to sleep with us that night and we went upstairs. On seeing the trouble created by Montmorency, Harris thought that the narrator had encouraged the dog. But the narrator feels that a dog like him cannot be encouraged. He has that original strength and original uh, sin which was born with him. So nothing can inspire him to be naughty. He was born with that trait. Finally, the packing was done at 12.50. Harris sat on that hamper and hoped that nothing was broken. George also thought that if something was broken, then it was broken and now nothing can be done about it. They were all ready for bed. Harris was supposed to sleep with them that night and so they all went upstairs to the room for sleep. We tossed for beds and Harris had to sleep with me. He said, do you prefer the inside or the outside, Jay? I said I generally prefer to sleep inside a bed. Harris said it was odd. George said, what time shall I wake you fellows? Harris said seven. I said no, six, because I wanted to write some letters. Harris and I had a bit of a row over it. Row here means argument. But at last split the difference and said half past six. Split the difference means that they agreed on 6.30 because it was halfway between 6 and 7. George made no answer and we found on going over that he had been asleep for some time. So we placed the bath where he could tumble into it on getting out in the morning and went to bed ourselves. Now they were all ready to go to bed but before going to bed they again had an argument at what time to wake up. When George asked Harris and narrator, Harris told him that he would like to wake up at 7 while the narrator said at 6. After having an argument over it, at last they decided that they will wake up at 6.30. So when they communicated this to George, George had already slept for some time. So they decided to place him near the bath so that whenever he tumbles, he can get into it right in the morning and they all went to bed.
Packing is an appropriate title for this extract from the novel Three Men in a Boat. It forms one of the chapters of that novel. The three men are Jerome, George and Harris. They have to go on a pleasure boat journey and have to pack for it. All three men think they are past masters in the art of packing, but all they end up creating is utter mess. They are disorganized, unplanned, foolish, careless and unsystematic and cannot properly pack a thing. They blame each other for being poor at packing and each boasts of his packing acumen. Thus, the extract is all about packing and therefore the title is appropriate. In this chapter, the writer Jerome boasts about his packing capabilities. But then at the end, he proves himself to be a disaster. So the moral of the story is never boast about yourself. Let your actions speak for you. The moral of the story can also be that one should keep his or her patience to do some work and one should not get too much overconfident of what he is doing or what results he may produce. Let the actions do the noise, not your boasting. Coming to the last section of this video, I'll be flashing summary in the written form and question answers related to this chapter which includes thinking about the text and thinking about language. So this is where I wrap up my today's session. I'll see you again in my next video with a new topic. Till then, take good care of yourself, keep smiling, be happy. Thank you and God bless you.